Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us with our Conversations with Karina series. I'm Suzanne Mulligan, and today, Karina and I are joined by members of the IMEX team as we focus on mental health in the workplace, especially how it impacts women and carers. Thank you all for being with us. Could you introduce yourselves and tell us why it was important for you to join the conversation? Rhiannon, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I'm Rhiannon Fimbo. I'm the Director for People and Talent at IMEX. Um, and for me, I've always been a real advocate for well-being and mental health. And I think now more than ever, um, you know, as we're working our way through the pandemic, I think it's just really important that we're having this conversation regularly and checking in um, on the progress that we're making. Excellent. Nalan, how about you? Hi, I'm Nalan Emre. My role is to oversee the operations of both our shows and I'm involved in the strategic development and decision making of the IMEX Group operations. Um, I've been with the company for 19 years and the reason why I wanted to join the conversation today is to share my experience with juggling a career and attending uh, to my little daughters. And um, yeah, I'd like to share the mental strain those relationships put on me both my uh, relationships with work, um, as well as my personal life and how I learned to deal with that pressure. Thanks, Malin. Kit, how about you? Yeah, I'm Kit Watts. I am communication strategist with IMEX and I'm really here just to share my own, um, some of my own mental health history that's generally impacted my work and, and how I've learned because it's always a learning practice how I've learned over the years to to cope and to uh, to deal with the issues that come up so happy to share those. Thanks Kit and finally Karina. Hello well I'm Karina I'm CEO of IMEX and um, you know I think um, mental health has always been important it's been growing in importance even before the pandemic and of course right across the world I think we've all suffered really a collective trauma um, and and so I think it's become even more important. I think organisations around the world are recognising that. Um, Harvard Business Review just at the weekend had some articles about the burnout pandemic, actually. So I think it's just, you know, it's always been important to us at IMEX. I think we're doing a better job of it now than we ever have to recognise it and talk about it. And we're keen to share what we're doing. Um, if that helps anybody, then we'd be delighted. And we're always happy to learn from others as well. So I think especially around a topic like this, uh, there's no one size fits all, there's no perfect answer, but I think talking about it within the industry um, will help all of us. Thanks, Karina. I think that's so important. And just to reference as well, that we are just talking from our own experiences here today. And we're all based in the UK where we are currently in our third lockdown of the year. And so I think that's a really, really valid thing to say. And I think recently I read an article in the New York Times around, it was a diary series that they're doing around the pandemic. And there was a quote from a working mother for, who said, right now feels like every other minute of the day, of the week, of the month, right now feels like forever. And the article went on to say that many diarists who had a history of depression or anxiety with their experience in managing their mental health actually helped serve them this year because they were used to battling uncertainty and gloom. But others who had no previous mental health diagnosis noticed those symptoms for the first time. So I'd love to hear a little bit about some of your mental health highs and lows in the past year. And Kit, would you like to go first? I'll share one and actually most of the people I think on this call witnessed it, which is one of our first, our first leadership meeting during the lockdown when we were on screen. And I remember just having a moment where I just felt completely and utterly overwhelmed in my aloneness. I think Nikki was there with her dog. Somebody else had a husband or a partner whose arm came in with a cup of tea. And it just, it just made me feel like my skin was raw. I had no idea. I even felt that alone until that moment. Nobody did anything on purpose. Um, but I do remember saying, look, can we just talk about the fact this isn't normal? We were just trying to, we'd gone straight into an agenda. And for me, the gap was just untenable. I, you know, physically in my body, I was all sorts of everything I didn't understand in the moment. And the only people I could talk to about it were the people on screen who appeared not to be feeling the same way. So um, that was a particular one for me. I totally understand that. I think that that's been something that we all can see though, is that 
um, somebody else from our team recently said that their home has seeped into their job in a way that it had never before mm -hmm. where, and that can be a, both a high and a low, I think for a lot of people is that feeling of being very alone or that feeling of being overwhelmed with people there's both sides of that. So I think that's that's such a valid point, Kit, and I appreciate that. I hope the leadership meetings, I know actually they have, we've started asking one to 10, how are you feeling? And I think that that's such an easy, maybe not a fix, but an easy way to make everybody feel like they've been checked in on. Yeah, no, I agree, Suzanne. I mean, I think what's been interesting actually in the past year is that as a team, whether that's a leadership team or the broader team, we have been given more permission to talk to each other about how we're feeling. And actually, you know, some of those early meetings, there were tears, you know, for all sorts of different reasons. There were tears about, you know, just the impact of canceling the show. There was concern about job security. There was um, fear of loneliness. There was fear and there still is about how you cope with having kids at home or caring responsibilities. So, um, we have talked to each other about those issues more than we ever did um, and actually I think what you were talking about Kit, in a way that was our transition period wasn't it between normal life before the pandemic where we come into the boardroom right this is the agenda let's get it done as quickly as we can and then we get our out and you know work, do our work versus now which is we still do that but actually our meetings we've thought a little bit more about how we're getting together and what we're talking about and the length of time we give people for their updates both personal and professional so um you know and i'm not perfect at that am i is the sort of often the facilitator of those meetings because i'm like right let's get on with it um but, but that's been a real learning curve for me as well i think that's really important though i think that the one thing is that we can all say is that we've learned this year. And I think that those things, actually that vulnerability that we're all being willing to share now is important and actually makes you a better leader. It makes you a better colleague. It makes you better at your job to be able to say, hey, actually I am really struggling right now or to be able to identify when somebody else is struggling. And so being able to raise your hand and say, I'm having a rough time and having a team come around you like IMEX has been able to do is really important. Nalan, could you talk a little bit about, about your highs and lows this year? Yeah, so I'll, I always set myself really high standards and being in the office, I'm so used to having back-to-back -back meetings, I'm, I'm super focused, I get lots done. So when we all started working from home, this was the end of March last year, all of a sudden I had a five-year-old and an eight-year-old around me who were absolutely ecstatic about being with mummy all day. For them it was all about having fun because usually they only see me in the evenings. So, um, and during the first lockdown, I took homeschooling really seriously. I followed the learning schedule, was, which was sent to us on a daily basis from the school. So we would sit down each morning, go through the homeschooling slides before I started my uh, working day. And I was hoping that they could get on with some of the work whilst I was on course, but I realized really quickly that it wasn't going to work. So the girls wanted to show me their work. They wanted feedback, they had questions and there was constant interruption. So on the one hand, it was wonderful having them around all day and it certainly brought us closer together and we've de developed a wonderful bond. But on the other hand, I really struggled with the interruptions when I was on calls and I just wanted to get on with my work. I, I constantly felt that there's this feeling of not getting as much done as I would usually do. And I put myself under immense pressure, which then caused yeah, mental pressure for me. And this was during the first lockdown. Then the second lockdown in the UK in, in November of last year, I just, I had learned my lesson. So when my five-year-old turned up, I just sat on my lap, we were in meetings, she joined the meetings with me, she joined the Zoom calls with me. It was just the way it was. But I also put up my hand and I was, I turned to my husband, he's in the construction industry. So he would leave in the morning, come back home late. 
and he had no idea what we <laughs> were going through at night. So I was like, I need some help here. I can't do this on my own. So he used to come home either earlier to be with the kids or he um, used to just take them to the showroom with him. So I would have a bit of me time and do more exercising, or, which t turned into a real luxury. So, but I think what will stick with me when we come out of now we're in our third lockdown and fingers crossed, this will be the last one. But uh, thinking of it, what will stick with me, I think what I will remember uh, from all these lockdowns is that the beautiful and strong bond we built as a family. Oh. I love that, Nolan, and I think that is so important, and I think a lot of people have felt that, and um, mm. I think that has been a positive. I know Rhiannon and I were sort of talking about both of our highs and lows, and I think you have kind of a similar high, don't you, Rhiannon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, the lows for me are also similar. I think the kind of overriding theme of it is guilt, a feeling of guilt that I wasn't doing anything well enough, and I think I was in quite a unique position in terms of I started IMEX on the first day of the first lockdown back, back in last March. So I felt that I was having to prove myself and, you know, really show up as the best I could be, whilst also having um, at that stage a, a three year old and a, and a seven year old or six year old as they were back in the first lockdown, who, again, similar to Nile, you know, wanted all of my attention, weren't old enough to do anything on their own and we're also struggling you know we're, we are all very sociable and I think they were suddenly also in a world where they couldn't see their friends they couldn't see their family didn't really understand what was going on so trying to protect them um, and juggle this kind of feeling of not being able to do anything well enough um, and I was in a, because mine are slightly younger I took a very relaxed approach to homeschooling the first time around which I think helped me in terms of I just really prioritized all of our mental health and thought as long as we feel safe and we feel happy and because I didn't want them to associate home with being stressful and me kind of mm -hmm. trying to get them to do things um, but it is a crazy world I mean this time around you know my, I'm very lucky in that my son loves schoolwork, but he's desperate to do maths and English and I'm having to say no can you just go and play because I need to do this call which is just a crazy world where you're kind of telling their kids you, they can't learn because I don't have time so it is that's been a real battle and I think that has impacted my mental health that's something that I've really had to balance um, but I think the highs are similar you know it is that um, taking that step back and not we were forever rushing everywhere you know the week was a quick to the childminder to work and running on the train I was running everywhere because I was always running late um, and then at the weekends we'd be right I need to see my brother who lives in London right we need to go and see our family here we need to see friends and I have a jam-packed social schedule as well um, so actually it's been lovely for me just taking a step back and really connecting with where we live so we moved just outside of Brighton two years ago um, but every weekend we just ran back to where our social was, social life in Brighton and hadn't really explored where we are. And, you know, we're very lucky we've got the downs one side and the beach the other side. So just having time to be with nature and fresh air and has really helped keep my perspective, I think, during this during this period. I think that connection back to nature, I see that in so many of my friends that being able to get outside um, and just get honestly fresh air. I, I'm back to work full time now after having a baby last year but I'm doing a lot of hours in a small and a condensed amount of time, which is an amazing opportunity for me, but it does mean sometimes I don't leave my desk. And now I've been building in time every day that I have to go and take a walk around the block because I notice that it affects my day and my mood so tremendously. Karina, do you want to talk a little bit about highs and lows of the year? Interesting listening to Rhiannon because I feel like my experience is really similar in the sense that I, I was telling somebody yesterday actually in early February I remember being in the car I just got back from an amazing trip uh, to the States I've been to the site conference in Vancouver and then our usual sort of January trip down to Vegas and um, you know then I was looking forward to the next trips that were on the agenda and um, but I also knew that I was constantly going just constantly and I remember vividly because this was just before everything hit thinking you know I wonder like would it be so bad if I didn't travel for six months like what would happen would it collapse you know may I just I need a pause 
And obviously, <laughs> I was telling someone yesterday, they were like, so this is your fault then. <laughs> um, and I said, well, yeah, I wasn't hoping for quite this type of pause um, or length. Um, but yeah, I think that sort of feeling of being on this treadmill that never stops um, was very real. And I certainly felt after the first lockdown, I don't want to go back to life where every evening and every weekend is scheduled because of all the kids activities and my travel schedule and whatever. And actually we did, you know, once September hit and the kids were back at school and things got back to a bit more normality here in the UK, we very quickly went back to that. And that's something I'm trying to think about because I have also enjoyed a bit more downtime in the evenings and also in the weekends. And I think we've got to kind of, you know, learn from those things. And the other thing that really was very valuable to me in March, just before lockdown, when we were going through the cancellation, and then in that first lockdown was just going out for a run. And I don't want to give the impression I'm some major runner, or, you know, I'm talking about like once or twice a week. Um, but just doing that for half an hour. And, and as Rhiannon said, where we live, you know, we're very close to the hills, uh, which are called the downs or the beach. Being able to do that once or twice a week was so important. It just gave me a chance to decompress. And actually on some of those runs, that was the time when it came out. So I cried on some of those runs in March. And um, I, you know, I, I didn't even feel a need to cry at any other time. It wasn't that I knew that was there, but I needed that to kind of get get through those emotions that's when it all came out and then I'd come back and be be really a lot better so I think getting out in nature doing some exercise um, and taking advantage of the downtime we have you know to rest and recuperate uh, is really important this weekend I just did nothing I didn't exercise actually and I felt guilty about not doing it and then I thought I just wanted to curl up and have a coffee and read the paper and that's okay, you know, so it's about just giving ourselves permission sometimes as well. I, I couldn't agree more. I actually feel like everybody has just said something along the lines of we are all in back to back meetings and we are all go, 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 go. I mean, it's very much our industry to be that way. Um, and Kit, I think something that you and I have talked about a bit as well is sort of the fact that now that we've all had to stop, that I think we are much more aware of our physical symptoms and sort of what it feels like to be struggling in a way that I think before we were sometimes able to shut the door to because we had to go, go, go. So I was hoping maybe you could touch a little bit on kind of how you recognized physical symptoms of struggling with mental health and also how others can help if they start to recognize that in their colleagues or in their friends. Mm. Well, actually, I think Karina's just given us a great anecdote, which is she didn't realize she needed to cry until she started crying. And that's that's what we've, I think a lot of us have done in the past and particularly during lockdown, which is we've become disconnected in a way from our bodies because we are dominated by the mind. I mean, the fact that we have to be on a Zoom call and this isn't everybody who's working clearly, but for those of us who would have used, used to be office bound, we're actually in a, a pretty strong mental trance most of the day. Um, which means that anything for a lot of us below the below the neck is not really getting listened to. I mean, how many of us kind of even um, wait to the last minute before we take a bathroom break because we're like, well, I don't want to leave the meeting. So I think in some ways it's given us habits of, of disconnecting from the body, but the body is often the thing, well, it's frequently the thing that will tell you when you really, really need to stop as everybody on this call knows full well. So for me personally, my, um, my first symptom that, that I've really got it too far is crying. I just can't stop crying. Um, and even in saying that, I sort of feel guilty. So the minute it happens, I'm like, oh, I've done this to myself again. I've let myself get this bad again. And then there can be a story, but if I was with somebody, they'd have noticed. Well, that's just the story in my head. So this is also part of the pandemic is the stories that we have in our head about the choices we've made and the lives we're living. They are, we've just apportioned meaning. That meaning doesn't necessarily serve us very well. It probably never has, but right now when you're facing it, it can be quite suffocating. So for me, it was off, it's always the can't stop crying literally for hours and hours. And that really for me means I've run out of physical energy uh, and my body has found quite a dramatic way of saying, 
now look what you've done you need to stop so yeah that's been my experience Great, thank you. And I'd like to go back to another point that has come up a couple of times um, in our conversations, and that is around sort of um, parenting well or caring well versus working well. And Karina, I know you and I have had a lot of conversations in the past, and you've you've used the term work life integration rather than work life balance, which I, I always really liked. Um, so I wanted to see kind of how has your work life integration felt since the pandemic started. Oh, well, that's a good question. Maybe you should ask my husband rather than me. Um, I think, look, I've always been somebody who's worked a lot. I think that's good and bad, isn't it? Um, certainly when you're at home, um, it's, you know, all the time, it's so easy to just pop back onto the computer. And in fact, that was always my modus operandi because I used to be anxious if I left my laptop in the office because, you know, I might need to do an email in the evening and it would be better to do it on my laptop than on the phone because it would be easier. So, you know, I, I've always been like that. I actually think in some ways, because the days are so intense, actually, when you're sitting in your office at home or sitting in the corner somewhere, that um, actually I've been a little bit better in some ways at putting things away in the evenings. But that actually, to be honest, I've only really managed that in since Christmas. I actually, last year, work took over everything and actually my husband said to me this is like when you first set up the shows you know so the setup of every show was massively intense and I always called the shows my vortex and certainly in the early years of each show in the sort of six weeks prior I would just go into this super focused place where everything else was filtered out and that was the only way I could deal with it and obviously over the years as the shows became mature and the team became mature, that wasn't so necessary. Um, and that's what the entirety of March to December last year was for me. It was a vortex. And honestly, I have two young kids at home. I did see them during the day. They, I, they did get on with stuff because they had to. I closed the door to this office and this is what I did. And that was the only way I could cope with the amount that needed to be done. But I was utterly, utterly exhausted by the end of November. Um, and I had three weeks off over Christmas and I needed it. And it was that period of truly taking time off that has allowed me to kind of reset and go, okay, like think about this, how are you gonna manage it? Because you can't, you know, you're not gonna be able to physically or mentally live like that um, going forward. I think that it's a fantastic point and it actually leads really well into my next question, which Nalan, I, I was hoping that you could answer. And I read a study recently by Microsoft that found that people are working after hours and on weekends more frequently now at home than they ever did before when they worked in an office. Um, and a similar study showed that remote work is leading to higher levels of stress and mental fatigue. So what are you doing, Nalan, to protect your mental health at home? But then also, what are you going to take with you when we do return to the office those learnings yeah I I was one of those moms who would rush the kids to bed early evening so I could just get on with with my work um, at night but when my daughter turned around and said mommy you are in front of your laptop all day and you're talking to people but you don't talk to us I knew I had to find a way to be to be focused and really efficient with my time during the day to get the same results as, as I was working in the office, but also to attend uh, to my daughter's needs. So instead of working continuously for several hours until I finish a project, um, I made a deal with, with my girls. So um, I, I said to them, I'll focus on my work for 30 minutes and then I'll take a 10 minute break to spend time with, with them. And um, I read about the, the Pomodoro technique. It tells you to work for 25 minutes and then take two minutes off. But I had to slightly um, change the technique to make it work for, for us because two minutes weren't 
quite enough for my girls. So I actually set the timer on my phone to, to 30 minutes and they knew when the timer went beep beep, it was mommy time. And then it's like set the timer again to 10 minutes. And uh, that's something um, that, that, really, that really worked for us. And I noticed that by taking those 10 minutes with the girls, I could focus again and I was, I was uh, rejuvenated and I could focus on, on, on getting work done until the next uh, break. And, and that's something that I would really like to take back to the office because I'm someone who just, just works. I work through my lunch break, although at, at IMEX, I mean, we really promote walking during the day and we do all of those things, but I've been so bad at, at those things. And I've, I've said to myself that going back to the office, that's one thing that I would really like to do go on a walk after lunch, even if it's like 20 minutes, it um, calms the mind. What we also did with the girls is after, well, almost every lunchtime or later in the day, we went for walks, going to the parks, just being in nature made such a difference to, to our mental health. And that's another thing that um, I'd, I'd like to do. And also with uh, the Pomodoro technique, it was so nice to, focus to have those time slots during the day and to really focus in those time slots what I want to achieve on the day or the week and get stuff done efficiently. So those are the two things that I'd like to continue doing when we go back. Uh, those are fantastic. Kit and I actually do a lot of meetings together. Um, we work on a lot of the same projects. And we, last week, I was part of a training that IMEX is doing around SDI and, and sort of the personality types of members of the team and, and how to lead better. And the woman who was running it, her name is Molly Harvey, she does the Pomodoro uh, technique with us. And so we do a 20 minutes and then we take a five minute break and then we come back for 20 minutes. And then that day, we were so excited about it that we started doing it. So Kit and I about four meetings that day. And honestly, it completely changed my mental space. And it changed it before I went into the meeting because I knew that 20 minutes in, I was going to get five minutes. So if I hadn't had time for a coffee or a water or to go outside and take a deep breath, I was still going to get that. Whereas some days my meetings are so back to back to back that I do get genuinely concerned about how I'm going to eat. So I think that's definitely something that we should bring back to the office that people can use. And just having a five minute break makes such a difference. So thank you for that point, Melon. I, I really appreciate that. Karina, in our recent blog interview with Emily Taylor, who's a career and development coach, she talked about how important it is to acknowledge that we can't do it all right now especially if you're caring for others while you're working. And she advises that we decide what we're choosing to give up or put on hold rather than just letting things slide by. And she says to ask yourself, what will matter in a year's time and what will I have forgotten about in a week? Does that resonate with you at all? Yes, absolutely. I think the one thing that I've always been relatively good at is focusing I've always kind of made that decision this is what I'm doing now this is what you know I'm giving up and I've kind of got I, I've understood that the one thing I would say though that 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 sort of idea of does this bit of work really matter now does it you know is it going to make a big difference or did you just think it was important last week and therefore you put it on the list and you're doing it and so I actually read a book in um, September called Essentialism by Gary McCowan and um, I just started reading it and it was like ding 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 you know this the wheels started turning and it really resonated with me and it was really about a deeper level of focus that I had than I had practiced before and I, I made some immediate changes um, to, to how I was working. And those are really having an impact now. And I bought a book for all of the leadership team. And I think it's like, you know, allowing yourself permission to say, is this really, truly important? Because I think what we, especially at IMEX, we, we can be bad at saying yes to too many things. Um, because actually we want to do lots of different things. We're excited about different projects. The team generally are people that put their hand up and go, yes, let me do it. Or, I, can, I can achieve that. And also I think the way we work with the industry and our partners, people come at us constantly with ideas. And of course, they're all great ideas. And so we constantly say yes to those. 
So I think essentialism has been really valuable for us to be able to give ourselves permission to step back. And in fact, that's kind of what we've been practicing for the last um, six to eight weeks in terms of what we're going to do in the digital sphere. And there's been a lot of pressure on us from externally to say, no, but what are you doing? Tell us now. And we've had to resist that pressure and say, actually, what we're doing is taking some time to truly plan um, sustainably what we can do and what we think is the best solution. I know also, Karina, you book into your day time for exercise, time to eat something. And I think a lot of times we're really bad about that, especially as Nolan said in the office, just leaving the office. We did a challenge um, two years ago now, or two, two IMAX Americas ago, where we tried to just get people to leave their desks to take a break because we were seeing that everybody was sitting at their desk and eating lunch because they do want to work. We do love what we do. And I just think it's so, so valid to put that time in and make sure that you're taking those breaks. Sorry, just to say that what Emily Taylor said about choices, that's the key thing, whether it's essentialism, whether it's her blog, it's about the choices you make and the priorities that you give. So are you going to prioritize your family, your kids exercise and to what level on each day? They can't, you can't have that priority every day at the same level, but you can balance that over time. And we do have the time for all of those things, but it is about the choices and priorities we make every day. And that's difficult, but, but we have to also, you know, the times where I've let exercise go, I've, the reason I've not felt guilty is because I've known that ultimately I made a choice not to prioritize the exercise for that month or two months. That was my decision. It's going to be harder to get back. I know that, but that was my decision. So I think, I think once you've got choice, like anything, it's about that sense of control. So can you find a sense of control over your life in the same way as you might over your work and, and et cetera? One of the big things that really matters to all of us is our health, because without that, we can't work. We can't make a contribution to our families or, or at all to our community in any way. So when you ask yourself, um, what are the few things that really matter? Those are the pieces to build your daily lives around. I think that's so important. Um, and actually, it, it brings us to a great question, which Rihanna, and um, you're our director of people and talent. You, you came in at the beginning of a pandemic, a really amazing time to start in a company. Um, but you are seeing the stress levels uh, you know, within the team rise firsthand. Um, and Kit often says that it's, it's only when we stop to reflect that we're able to be more aware, but stopping and reflecting right now is something that I don't have time for. So how can employers help their teams to be more conscious of that stop and pause? Yeah, I mean, we put a few things in place to really try and support people through this period. I think the main, um, the main support that we felt was really um, vital was creating some space. So we've created um, COVID support leave, which is five paid uh, days leave, which can be taken either, you know, a couple of days at a time, a day here and there, half days, hour chunks, whatever works for people. And that's around giving people whether it is that you need to do some homeschooling on that day so you can just clear your day to focus um, on supporting your children, whether that's that you want to um, support, you know, you've got elderly relatives, any kind of caring responsibilities and also self-care. You know, we've got lots of people, as Kit mentioned, that are really struggling um, with loneliness potentially through this this pandemic and actually might be feeling a sense of overwhelm and needing some just some time to look after themselves. We've also looked at mental health awareness. So we put all of our, our line managers on a mental health awareness training day um, last year um, in the summer, which was really helpful. And I think it's we, we've recognised it a couple of times in some of the conversations today is that important role. Everyone's got their own struggles. So I think that's been the vital thing. And that's been so lovely to see at INEX because I think that is our nature, you know, we are very kind people. So I think that's helped in terms of having those conversations and just that people feel open and, and supported and they've got a number of different routes of people that they can reach out to. The other thing that we felt was really important was to um, support people with flexible working because as we've all said, everyone's trying to juggle things at the moment. So we um, ran a series of focus groups to find out what people had really valued around um, working from home and how we could incorporate some of those aspects in terms of when we move out of the pandemic as well as 
as, as, as this year. So we've introduced a new flexible working policy, which is really um, giving people opportunities to be truly flexible, whether that's having a couple of days from home a week um, to balance that kind of life admin, um, but also having real flexibility with your hours. You know, some of the things that came through the focus groups were that people really valuing that they've been able to pick their children up from school. You know, they hadn't had any relationship with their children's teachers and actually we, we've kind of um, really accelerated where we are with flexible working because everyone's been forced to work from home. I think it's built this culture of trust that actually everyone can deliver their role. Um, we just need to empower people, you know, focus on what the output is and what they're delivering rather than this kind of presenteeism. Are they in the office nine to five? Actually, if they want to be in the office for a few hours in the morning and then go home so they can pick their children up from school, have a couple of hours and then pick up some work in the evening, um, you know, then that's absolutely okay. So I think I think that has been a positive moving out of the pandemic that I think we, we've really established some, some really positive flexibility in terms of how people can work. And I think that really supports mental health, you know, whether it's the nature that we've talked about, about having some time in your day, during the, when it's daylight, to be able to take a break and go for a walk and that being okay, that you're not having to feel that you're chained to, to teams and available at all times. Um, so that's, that's been a real positive, I think, that will benefit people's mental health coming out of this as well. Absolutely. I think also being able to take maybe even a longer lunch break, you know, being able to say, actually, I'm going to take, and we've actually had that for quite a long time, the, the ability to sort of change your hours within the day. So I think we're really forward thinking when it comes to that. And Karina, let's, let's ask our last question to you. So as we all know, event professionals are inherently social. We're used to traveling and networking and meeting face to face but both living alone or being furloughed or, or just being home and having to work like this um, has been really difficult now that we're all grounded. So do you think event professionals are suffering more than others? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly, um, certainly in the early days of the first lockdowns of the pandemic, people were talking about, you know, the extroverts in the world struggling the most because, um, you know, we are used to, um, as you say, meeting face to face and many event professionals aren't extroverts, but they understand the value of, of connecting face to face and what that gives them. And it gives us a deep sense of uh, community, I think, you know, as event professionals, it's amazing industry in that regard, you know, it's an amazing community. So on the one hand, we have come together a lot, haven't we, online, um, more than probably other industries, uh, but we've really, truly missed that, that contact. So, yeah, I think, I think we have struggled uh, from that perspective. But of course, you know, our industry is one of the industries that was um, impacted first. We know we're going to be kind of last coming back. And of course, it's been a devastating time right across the globe. I remember uh, in autumn last year, uh, hearing a report that the global events industry was at 2% capacity. I mean, you know, it's when you hear statistics like that, it's extraordinary. So I think we've had an additional level of anxiety and stress right across the board, of course, for those that have been furloughed or made redundant, but also for those that are in a job who does who they might not know how long that's going to last. And for those people that have spent a career building up the skills for this industry, it's I think there's been this added layer in, we're not the only industry heavily impacted, but I think there's sort of five key industries like ours who have been massively impacted and so that level of, of anxiety is um, it is very different you know it's not comparable to other industries so I, I think we've had all of those things together and that I guess you know brings us on to the importance really of what the industry is doing at the moment the trade associations the go live together coalition in the states uh, that one industry one voice which is here in the UK um, and and all the trade associations really have collaborated and come together and I think you look at what MMB are doing and and US travel and particularly in the states um, and they are having um, successes you know the care act um, did finally provide provision for DMOs and CBBs. So, you know, we're, it, it's slow and steady, and I think we need to be patient. And, and hopefully that gives people uh, a degree of hope. And the other thing I would say is that 
you know, at this point in time when the industry is essentially closed down in most parts of the world, it's very easy to get ourselves into this spiral of it will never come back or things are going to be so fundamentally different. The new normal means no events. And, and I've heard people in our industry talking in that way. And I would just say, you know, that millennia of human nature doesn't change overnight. And a year or two years is overnight in the scheme of human evolution and I, I do not believe for a moment that people will not need or want to come back together to uh, feel connections to be motivated to understand um, you know communicate their brand values or just to be together you know and uh, that's not going to change so will there be differences of course I'm sure there will um, there'll be some kind of new normal that we don't know what it is but there's no indication I can see that a new normal is a normal without business or, or leisure or fun events so I would just give that message of hope I think to people that um it's a tough time for our industry, no doubt, but it will come back. And I think it will come back booming. Thanks, Karina. I think that's a, an incredibly important point. Just to be able to connect again will mean so much. To connect live face to face will mean so much. So um, I'd just like to say thank you all for joining us today. This has been <clears throat> a really interesting conversation to get to have with all of you. Um, and I wanted to end by saying I, I read a blog recently on EventWell that EventWell had done, and it was about walking and mental health. And it was called Putting One Step in Front of the Other is Enough. And I just think that in this world of unknown that we're currently living in, that that's enough, putting one step in front of the other and keeping moving forward while being willing to raise your hand and say, I'm struggling, or to be able to raise your hand and say, I see you. So I think if we can all come out of this and work towards that, continue to be those people, I think it'll be really helpful. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you.